So welcome to numerical methods for mathematical finance. And in our last session, yeah, we somewhat finished our discussion on random number generation. And my next session will be stochastic processes. So actually we will look at time discretization of stochastic processes. But we will do this time discretization of stochastic processes because I would then like to apply the Monte Carlo method to stochastic processes. So before going to time discretization, I can just discuss the Monte Carlo method in the context of time discrete stochastic processes. So for me, a time discrete stochastic process is just a family of random variables say S of T0, S of T1, S of T2. So S of Ti parameterized by an integer I. So it's not of T you know, over time, it's just an integer. And so it's just a vector, a random vector. And so you see, we are in the uh, situation of our Monte Carlo method. Let's first look at time discrete E2 processes. Okay, what, what do I mean with that? An E2 process is time continuous stochastic process. Actually, I mean where the random variables are just a function of discrete Brownian increments. And as a motivation, look here again at our universal pricing theorem at the universal valuation theorem. So we have that the value of a financial derivative can be expressed as an expectation. And if it is now say a European option, say V of T is the payoff function of some underlying. Okay, then I see the expectation of this random variable V of T multiplied with the ratio of the numerators, yeah, because it is numerator relative prices are martingales, okay? So, but it's this scheme that you have here, the payoff as a function of a random variable S of T. So we had a look at this, yeah, the Black-Scholes model applied to a European option. And S of T was here just um, a random variable. But if you look at, another financial product, more general one, for example, the Asian option, then this guy here may just depend on multiple random variables, a random vector. So if you look at an Asian option, then you have that your payoff function, V of capital T, actually depends on the average Okay, there's a small typo that should be here an M. Yeah. The average of say some past values S of Ti, these past values T1, T2, and so on to Tm yeah, uh, are less or equal my maturity capital T. And then in capital T, which is usually then the last point here, I'm looking at how is this average? How has this average behaved? Yeah, so what is the maximum of the average minus K and zero? So it's a call option on the average of the stock prices. And if S is now the stock price, it is a random uh, variable. So you see that actually your payoff depends on a whole random vector. So I have the random vector S of T1, okay, so which is this guy, S of T2, which is this guy, and so on. So all the S values at different times. So you see, if you do look at this as a Monte Carlo integral, so if you like, like to approximate here this expectation as a Monte Carlo integral, this is already an m-dimensional integral because you have m different components here in your random vector. And the m components 
are actually a time discrete stochastic process. Yeah? So you have here the S of T1 and then your stock moved to a different level. You have here the S of T2 and so on, you know, the S of T3. Your time discrete stochastic process. So if you have um, a stochastic process, time discrete parameterized by time, you know, integer times, or if you have a vector you know, of um, random variables, a random vector, that's just interpretation. So in other words, what I would like to sample is a time discrete pass omega of the stochastic process S. You know, so I maps to S of Ti omega. So you immediately see that actually time relates to the dimension of my Monte Carlo integral. So I would like to approximate now the expectation of F of, and then an M dimensional random vector. So that was now the Asian option as a financial product. But next step is how are these random variables here defined? And this definition is given by the model. So the next step is the model. And take, for example, our Black-Scholes model. So in the Black-Scholes model, I can explicitly, analytically, so I have a closed formula, closed form um, expression. I can explicitly write S at Ti plus one as a function of S of Ti. And hence I can actually write S of Ti plus one as a function of the initial value and some parameters and some other stuff. When I have in addition, a normal distributed random variable Zi. So I can write here my vector S of T1 to Tn as a function of a vector Z of zero to Z n minus one, where these Z are iid random variables. Okay, now I use little ti's here, not the capital ti's uh, or tj's that are used for the Asian option, because you could choose that you use a much finer time discretization here for the generation of these s's. Yeah? Maybe you have different options, different Asian options that all have different time discretizations. So it could be that you, you need here for all these valuations, a much finer time discretization. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe just recall this. Okay, the Black Scholz model. Okay, that's here the um, ETO process. So the Black Scholz model here written in this differential form. Yeah, so the S, uh, say, of zero is just a little less zero, the initial value. Then, you know, if you move to the transformed variable logarithm of S, yeah, so if you move to the logarithm of S, you can apply Ito's lemma and you get this expression here for dy, y being the logarithm. So d logarithm S, it's mu minus one half sigma squared dt. Yeah, the minus one half sigma squared comes from Ito's lemma plus sigma dw. And now you see these are constant coefficients. You can just apply the integral to this d s now or the d log s actually this is log here wow sorry there's a there's a typo uh maybe i i'm a bit lazy and i write y here okay so this is this is the logarithm so you can you can now just um uh apply the integral to this and you see this guy here has a constant coefficient. Yeah, so integrating this constant here just gives you the constant times, the time step size integrating this constant here gives you the constant and then comes the Brownian, Brownian increment so Brownian motion of Ti plus one minus Brownian motion at Ti. So, but since you know that actually the Brownian increment 
is normal distributed with mean zero and standard deviation square root of time step, you can just write the Brownian increment as square root of time step times the set i. We will come to this uh, later, but then now if you take the exponential on this here, yeah, then you see that this is the next value is the previous value multiplied with the exponential of this expression that was on the right hand side. And you see that in this model, you can represent all the S's as functions of the random variables set I. So you see again that if you now compose all the functions, so the SI's are functions of the standard normal, a vector of IID standard normals. And for the Asian option, my payoff is a function of these SI's. Okay, then you see that you calculate the expectation of a complicated function of this vector of standard normals. And that's just the situation which we had for our Monte Carlo method. We just have now a vector of standard normals. So we have an n-dimensional Monte Carlo integral you know, that approximates the expectations. You know how to generate the standard normal random numbers. Uh, you can just take maybe a pseudo random number generator, use the inverse of the distribution function and populate here this vector one by the other. And that has sampled the vector. And then you plug this all in, in these functions and take the average to calculate the expectation. So our Monte Carlo method so far already applies to stochastic processes. So Monte Carlo simulation for stochastic processes is nothing new. It's just that the stochastic processes, the time steps are the components of vectors. So the vector S is a function of the vector Z and the vector Z can now be defined using inverse of the cumulative distribution function of say a vector of uniforms. And then you just sample your uniforms using your random generator. Okay, so once we have discretized the stochastic process, I can apply my Monte Carlo method in a very natural way. But a remark, you see that the Monte Carlo simulation of stochastic processes is inherently high dimensional. So you see that if we need to simulate, say for our Asian option or for some other application, yeah, and n-dimensional vector because we have n time steps. Yeah? So n is just the number of time steps. Then if we have many time steps, say because the option is an average over many periods or because our model requires some fine time stepping. Next section is time discretization of stochastic processes. And you see that these are approximation schemes that become better when we make the time step smaller. Yeah, so from this next application, I already have the pressure that I should have many time steps. So, but n is the number of time steps. It's the length of my vector in my Monte Carlo integral. So you see it's an n-dimensional integration where n is the number of time steps and it's easy to have many time steps. So 100 time discretization points, you know, it's maybe not unusually. So you see that Monte Carlo approximation, you know, sometimes then I say Monte Carlo simulation of stochastic processes is inherently high dimensional. And now high dimensional is not something like five or eight as we did it for the um, Simpsons integration. Yeah? Now it's dimension 100, something like that. So the number of time steps 
relates to the dimension of the Monte Carlo integral. And this can even be the case for um, a European option. So even if you have a European valuation that only depends on the random variable at a single future point in time, so S of capital T, it may be that the time stepping scheme of the stochastic processes requires many time steps because um, otherwise the time stepping scheme is inaccurate. But that will be um, a topic in the next session. Okay, so now I would like to discuss Monte Carlo simulation for a different process, the Poisson process. The previous example was Monte Carlo uh, method applied to a time discrete ETO process. And you saw that there was an easy scheme that time steps and time steps become N vectors. So if you have a one-dimensional stochastic process, it becomes an n-dimensional random vector, an n-dimensional integral. If you have a two-dimensional stochastic process that simulates two random variables, say S1 and S2, uh, it becomes now a two times n, yeah, because each of these has n time steps, two times n, yeah, at, at most two times n, dimensional integral, dimensional vector, but you just have a collection of random variables lying around, which can be interpreted as a vector and you just generate random drawings of this vector valued random variable. For the Poisson process, the Monte Carlo simulation scheme is a little bit different and it's maybe a very nice, very funny, funny example. Yeah? And uh, also in the end, uh, you get another nice intuition for the thing that the Monte Carlo method uh, breaks this curse of dimension. So actually it doesn't grow exponentially in the dimension, it just grows linear in the dimension. So Poisson process is a nice example. So what's the Poisson process? First here, one possible definition, yeah, maybe the one that gives us the best intuition and also how, how we use the process. So a Poisson process with intensity lambda is just defined by counting the jumps that are modeled by random times where the random time increment is exponentially distributed. So I have here stochastic times, maybe I write this here. So Ti is a stochastic time, where actually Ti is defined as the sum of time intervals. So it is here, one less or equal j less or equal y, where this time interval, my zi, so this is the time interval length. Uh, so I'm adding all these time intervals. Uh, so z uh, t2 is t1 plus the time interval z2 uh, um, from t1 to uh, T2, where all these Zs here are exponential distributed with intensity lambda. Uh, okay, so the, the Zi well, would be the Ti minus Ti minus one. This here is my exponentially distributed set i, yeah? so the time time increment is exponentially distributed. So we already had a nice intuition for exponential distribution here. Yeah? So the probability that the jump uh, arrives yeah, doesn't depend on the past and so on. Um, so it's just that you repeat the experiment from the exponential distribution again and again. Yeah? So you get more and more times. And then the Poisson process just counts the number of jumps. So 
this here is counting the number of jumps counting number of jumps that have size one and occur at these random times. So for some path, say omega one, yeah, you see you have here, this guy here is the time T2 of omega one. Yeah, so it jumped up there. And this time here is the second jump on the path omega two. So this is here's T2 of omega two. So you see the, the times are random and we just count here. So the jumps that have happened before here, the little little T, yeah, that's my counting counting process. Okay, so I'm, I'm sure you know this guy. There's also an inhomogeneous one as we had for the inhomogeneous exponential distribution, you maybe remember this, the inhomogeneous thing is just a time transformation. And hence you can write an inhomogeneous Poisson process um, X, you can just write it as the homogeneous process Y. So a Poisson process with density one, and then use the corresponding time transformation. Okay, so maybe we don't go into details with the inhomogeneous one. And ask ourselves, how do we now do a Monte Carlo simulation of such a Poisson process? So in the previous example of the Plague-Scholz model, well, the situation was quite involved. Yeah, there were a lots of function and random variables, but in the end, it boiled down that we had a time discretization, so a fixed time discretization. So we had this thing that we looked at fixed times ti, and we had fixed random variable s of ti, and we could map this then to the random variable zi, and there was a fixed random vector, an n-dimensional vector. So here it was a fixed, n-dimensional vector, yeah, because the S of T0 is deterministic. Yeah? If you would like, you can also add the S of T0 to your vector, whatever, but it was a fixed dimensional vector and then it could very nicely define your Monte Carlo integral. Uh, for the Poisson process, this approach is, well, only useful in special situations, namely in situations where you are only interested in the N of Ti, but often you are really interested in these random times. So you cannot give yourself a time discretization. Yeah, You see here a time discretization because the random times, they may be at a different location that is not on your time discretization grid. And imposing that they are on the time discretization grid would already be, well, an approximation. And also note another thing. If you look at the stochastic process, they up to a certain time horizon. Yeah? So assume that there is here a certain time horizon, capital T. And you would like to simulate this process up to capital T. I mean, I have to specify some time horizon because my computer has to, to end at a certain time. Then you observe here in already in this little picture. Okay, how many jumps do you have on omega one? It's one, two, three, four, five. How many jumps, how many random times do you have on, on omega two? It's T1. T2, T3, it's three. Yeah? So one has five times, the other one has three times. So the number of random times on every path is different. Okay, so this guy here has five times, five jumps, and this guy here has uh, three. Yeah? So the n will jump from zero to five on the other one, it will jump from zero to three. 
So the situation is here a bit more complicated. Yeah. So often one is interested in the specific jump types. So we would like to have the 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 set of ends, and they should lie maybe in some interval from zero to capital T, but they should not be restricted to some time discretization. So we know that our Poisson process is built from IID random variables, all having exponential distributions. So from these set I's, so the time intervals until we have the next jump. So I could write here TK is the sum of ZI, ZI of is this time interval, all on a path omega J. And then I have that my Poisson process is constant, it's equal to K. Yeah, okay, so this is here, this constant level. When you are between these two jump times, so you can define your Poisson process like that. N is equal to K for all little t that are in between your random times, TK and TK plus one. Yeah? TK included, TK plus one, not included. And this condition depends on omega. So you see that the number of exponential distributed random variables that enter into the definition of my n depends on the omega. Yeah? So for a given path omega, I need to draw, say, omega j is now my path, I need to draw nj, so j means that it depends on the omega j. I need to draw nj random numbers. So these random numbers are my z i j yeah, from an exponential distribution where the nj is such that, okay, for the last point, so for k equals nj, the previous jump was before my time horizon. Okay, so t is here my time horizon. The previous jump was before my time horizon. The next jump would be after. So you stop sampling the random variable when you have reached the time horizon. So the funny thing of this stochastic process is that the amount of random numbers needed to sample one sample path depends on the sample path. So you could think of it as being a vector of random variables zi. Yeah? So z1 from t0 to t1, z2 from t1 to t2, yeah? until you have reached the time horizon, maybe z nj, whatever. Then you have populated the vector, but the next vector may be shorter or longer. So this is a strange situation. Yeah? If you now assume that you value a financial product, so I look here that a financial product depends on the jump times. So if I would like to value this financial product, I calculate the expectation of a function that depends on these stochastic times. Yeah? So the t here is my jump time, my stochastic my stochastic time. Then if you would look at this with the picture of a Monte Carlo integral, then what is actually now the dimension of the Monte Carlo integral? Yeah? It's vectors of variable lengths. So it has a stochastic dimension. Huh? Okay, that's maybe a funny situation. Uh, so you see this, this view doesn't fit here, but actually to some extent it is one dimensional because if you think of a pseudo random number generator, what we will do is we will generate Z, the exponential distributed random numbers until we have filled the path and then we jump to the next path. 
So actually, we don't care when we when we have populated the vector, if it is five dimensional, six dimensional, we just populate it until we have reached the time horizon, and then we jump to uh, the next pass. So this is like in this situation here, uh, where we created a, a vector from a one dimensional sequence. No? And there it was always that we take two guys here to populate these two entries. But now it's just we take as many guys until we have filled or until we have reached the time horizons. No? And you see the Monte Carlo method didn't care if I calculate a function in one dimension and I have many elements with, from my sequence or a function in five dimension and I'm populating the um, um, I'm populating the components of the vector. So this is a bit similar to our method generating a random vector from a one dimensional sequence yeah except that now our vectors uh, they have somewhat a variable length and also maybe just illustrate a little bit the intuition why the Monte Carlo method scales linear in the dimension. There is another important um, aspect here. Uh, if you have this counting process, it always jumps up you know, at the jump times, but then you can subtract the, say, expected frequency yeah, of the jump multiplied with the time. So we already know lambda is the frequency. So multiplied uh, with the time yeah, is the expected amount of jumps in that time. And if you subtract this, then you know that this guy here is a martingale, so has um, expectation zero. And maybe I would like to conclude by implementing a Monte Carlo simulation um, of this guy with you, because I really like that this um, implementing the Poisson process is such a little bit different from implementing Monte Carlo simulations of other stochastic processes. And we will have the other stochastic processes again and again later in the lecture. Yeah? So let's have a small exercise, perform a Monte Carlo simulation of this stochastic process. And you can also uh, look at this here in our repository. Okay, so let's create um, a small Monte Carlo simulation for the Poisson process. So I call this now Poisson process experiment. And uh, I would like to plot the sample path. Yeah? So I would like to plot the sample path. Yeah? Plot. Poisson path. Yeah, I would like to have, say, 1000 sample paths. Let's define a few constants here. Um, I would like to have a time horizon that is 10 years. This is my capital T. And maybe I also like to have my parameter lambda, my, but maybe I set it to one. So I need a random number generator. So random number generator, one dimensional one from which I generate my, uh, uh, from which I generate my exponential time intervals, exponential distributed time intervals. So let's use a mass and twister, whatever. I use a maps and twister with some seed, so we get always the same result. So I would like to have a list of the random times. So first part is generate the random times. So I would like to have a list of the random times. Okay, this is a list here of floating point numbers, but then I have this list for every path. So I have a list of a list. So let's have these. These are my jump times, but for every path. So this is an array list of a list of floating point numbers. So I will store 
uh, my results in this list and then I can use it later. So now I generate all the sample paths. So for the index of my sample paths, yeah, my omega j running from zero being smaller than the number of sample paths. For these I do now. So now I generate the sample paths omega j and I would like to store all the random times. So now I go through all the random times. So these are my jump times. I need a list where I store all my random times. So my jump times. Um, well, I need some variable where I store the jump times. Okay, this is my next jump time. Okay, let's initialize it to zero. And while this guy, this is now my T, the T that I'm generating is below the maturity. Whoops. Yeah, while this guy is below the maturity. Okay, this here is a while. I need to generate more time steps, more times. So let's create the time step. Again, generate a uniform random number from my random number generator. Transform the uniform to the exponential distributed. This is my random time step. Okay, the exponential distribution is minus logarithm of the uniform or one minus the uniform. She doesn't care. Okay, and divide by the lambda. So one divide minus one divided by lambda logarithm of one minus u. Okay, so one minus u, but the one minus isn't. Element. Okay, so that's my, my random time step. Then I add this time step to the jump time. So this is the sum of this set. Yeah, T is equal to the sum of the set that I'm calculating. Okay, and this guy is then my next jump time and I'm storing it. But I only store it if this jump time is before the maturity. Yeah? I would like to filter out um, everything that is after. Okay, you could also leave this less or equal if you like. Doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, so I add this to my jump times array. And you see this here is the variable length yeah? because I'm filling now this, this list with more and more jump times until I reached uh, I have reached uh, the maturity. So, and when I have reached maturity, then I add this. So, and when I have reached maturity, then I add this sample path. This is now my omega, my sample path. I add it to the list of all the sample path jump times. That's the Monte Carlo simulation of the random times that make up the Poisson process. Mm, well, now let's define the function that defines the process. So let's define the function T maps to N of T, or if I would like to have the compensate process, the N of T minus Lambda times T. Yeah? So let's do the compensate process. So I have a function that maps time so say a function that maps a double to um, say um, a vector of double, uh, we could say a double array. Yeah? So because N is a random variable for a fixed time, yeah, I have N of omega zero, omega one and all the paths. Uh, so actually I have a function that maps a time to a random variable. So I have this already as um, a fixed class. So this is a double two random variable function. So we can look at this later. Yeah, it's not such a big uh, deal now. Yeah, could also do it with the array. And 
let's define now the n. So I have a vector. This is the random sample vector of the n. So this is um, a vector of length number of paths. Okay, so this will n of t for all the omegas. So then I go through all the paths. Okay, maybe I can just copy this here. This is a loop over all the sample paths. And I would now like to populate this vector. So what do I need to do? I need to, now let's call this a singular time. I need to count how many jump times were before time. Okay, I can very easily count using um, a Java stream. So I take my jump times that occur on this sample path. This is a list of floating point double numbers that represent the jump times. From this, I make um, a stream, a stream of numbers. Then from the stream of numbers, I filter out the numbers that are after. So the criteria, the filter criteria is the time t should be less or equal the given time. Okay. And from this, then I count all the elements. Okay, so this is a nice one-liner. You could also do it more explicitly. So this is the number of jump times that have occurred before. And now you can set your function n on this given path. Your function n on this given path is the count n of t. And if you do the compensator, it's minus lambda times time. Oh, okay, so that's it. So I have to return this, this random variable. Actually, if you would do it classically, you would just return here this vector, but actually I have a Java class that encapsulates random variables. So you can use this here, the random variable from double array, say with, okay, you have to say specify here a time and the values. You can do it like this. Um, the advantage of doing it like this is that now I have a function that immediately plots the um, stochastic uh, process. Sorry, here there's a small mistake. Of course, here to the array jump times, I add the next jump time. Okay, he already complained about this. So last step, plot the function. So plot the process. I have a little helper that, that uh, does this. So um, my plotting algorithm now needs a time discretization. So I would like to plot now, say, t j n of t j. Okay, that's just because my plotting needs to plot some 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 points. So for this, let's create a time discretization. Uh, there is a Java class that can encapsulate here this time discretization. So it should start in zero. It should have a certain number of time step steps and um, so how many time steps do we take? Let's take 1000 and then what is the time step size? Okay, the time step size is 0 0.01. So it go from zero to 10 years. Okay, so I would like to plot now the process on this very fine time discretization. So now I have here um, a helper that allows to plot a process Yeah, so you have to specify the time discretization and the process. And if you do not like to plot all the sample paths, then you can also specify that you only would like to see 200 sample paths. So that's it. Yeah. Well, I hope I didn't do anything wrong. And let's have a look how this looks like. I forgot one thing, I have to show the plot. Okay, so uh, that's here. 
So let's have a look how it looks like. Okay, that looks quite nice. Okay, so this is your martingale. If you do not do the process with the compensator, so this is just the N, then it looks like that. Okay, so you see it's the jump process. It jumps up always by one thing. Okay, so maybe you can also set here a label. So this is time. So it jumps up by, by N. And if you do the compensated process, you see, okay, it will always go linearly down. Yeah, so it goes linearly down, but then it jumps up and you see it's, it really looks nice. Yeah, it looks like a, like a martingale. Yeah? So maybe you can also increase or decrease a little bit the lambda. Okay, if you have smaller lambda, you have fewer jumps. Okay, fewer jumps. The decreasing is also smaller. And if you have a very high lambda, you have much more jumps, okay? Well, okay, that almost looks like a Brownian motion. Uh, so here in our repository, this is here, the thing that we just did. And there's also the same plot for um, a Brownian motion. So you can also have a look maybe at home at this. It will generate sample path of a Brownian motion, which would look like that. Yeah, you see that I, I, I like this a little bit because it is a little bit different, yeah, uh, doing Monte Carlo for this Poisson process and to finish, uh, now I think we have a random vector of variable length. How would you now do lo low discrepancy sequences in this situation? So what I just did was really relying on the fact that I had a random number sequence that represents a single event on a sequence of IID random variables. Yeah? So this serial independence. Speaking of low discrepancy sequences, you have to be aware that for a low discrepancy sequence, uh, you cannot use this trick of populating a vector. So you have to create a low discrepancy sequence in high uh, dimension. And we saw the dimension in stochastic processes can be very high. Yeah? We can have dimension 100. So to use low discrepancy sequences here in this uh, setup, you have to um, really consider multidimensional, so high dimensional, low discrepancy sequences. So next chapter is if we have a general stochastic process, say an ITO process, how do we do Monte Carlo simulation there? Yeah, we create a time discrete version, a time discrete approximation, we will look now at time discretization schemes. Yeah? Euler scheme, Milstein scheme, log Euler scheme. So that will be our next chapter. That was it for today.